reporting. So good morning, everybody. Today is Saturday, the 4th of April, I believe. And we are all linking in from our relative homes. Um, David Parry, conductor of uh, La Cenerentola at the Grange, sadly not in 2020, but maybe in 2021 or maybe in 2022. That's to be confirmed as soon as possible. Um, but we um, are determined to do it because for, for, for many, many reasons. Uh, David, you're speaking for your home in Norfolk, in England. And Stephen, good morning. Your good morning. And director of this uh, wonderful show, but uh, well, I know it's going to be wonderful because we have um, we have uh, bits of it already on stage at the Grange. And uh, all of you, and I'm going to introduce in a minute our star singer, leaving her till last. But Stephen, you're speaking this morning on uh, eleven sixteen on Saturday, the fourth of uh, April, from your house in Kennington in South London. It's lovely to see you. Thank you so much to you all for doing this. And then our third, I'm, I've left to last, because her situation is more complicated. Jose Maria Lomonaco, who many of you will remember when she was appeared for the first time in her life singing in the UK at the Grange two years ago, singing Rosina from Barbara Seville, Il Barbieri di Siviglia. And she won all our hearts instantly. So we thought we had to put on another show with you three, but especially with her. So we've planned this La Cenerentola. And we're going to have a little bit of chat and a bit of uh, excerpts from it this morning. And so the first thing I want to do is to start with Stephen, whose production we created. Now, Stephen, we have this curious situation. There we are. We're all sitting from home. We can't do anything. But you're amazing. And Andrew Edwards is designing set is sitting on the stage at the Grange waiting to be used. And it's a thing of extreme beauty and elegance and wit just like your barber was. Would you like to say a little bit more how you've approached this and what, it, what it's going to look like and feel like? And just, uh, just for a few minutes. Sure. Um, uh, well, uh, we're very excited to, to get the chance to do it. And we're, we're really grateful that you are keeping faith with the production. Um, uh, and uh, our starting point actually for Chanarenta, neither Andrew or I had done the opera before, um, was actually not with the title character. Uh, obviously, we know uh, the story of Cinderella from many different versions, but our starting point was actually the, the sisters because um, unlike uh, Disney or uh, the grim fairy tale, um, the sisters in La Cenerentola uh, are not evil and they're not ugly. Um, <laughs> they're unattractive in terms of their qualities. They're selfish and vain and they treat their stepsister badly but they're not the exaggerations that you find in more uh, perhaps popular uh, uh, tellings of the tale. And that made us think about uh, how they're obsessed with their outer beauty. And Chenarentla, of course, is all about her inner beauty, which they fail to recognize. Everyone fails to recognize except for the prince. Um, and that got us thinking about um, vanity and beauty. And before we knew it, we were somehow locating our production in America in the 1950s. And um, we sort of moved away a little bit from some of that, but that's, and at the time we were talking about it, I said to Andrew, this is a summer festival and this should be, Chenarentola is the one piece of the program that people are gonna look at and say, this is, should be fun. This is going to be, um, this should be elegant. It should be witty. It should be fun. So I said, we don't want to do a really deep psychological Chenarentola, which you can do. And of course has been done by other brilliant directors. I said, we need to go for something that is real summer festival fun fair. And at the time we were having this discussion, the Dior exhibition was on in London and Andrew had, had seen the sort of mother load version in Paris. And that got us thinking about things like the film Roman holiday with, Audrey Hepburn and got us thinking about Grace Kelly and her marriage to the Prince Charming of Monaco in the 50s and somehow we ended up with this sort of Dior inspired uh, production which I think is going to be um, uh, uh, very uh, beautiful and witty and of course most of all we're inspired because it's very um, rare for me that you get to build a production on a star uh, that you've already worked with in the case of our wonderful Jose Maria. And having worked with her, David and I, when we were working um, on Barbieri two years ago, we both looked at each other and said, 
we have to do Cenerentola because <laughs> obviously it's a perfect role, a role that Jose Maria has done brilliantly in other productions. And so this production was really, is being built as a, a tribute um, to her and for her. And um, I know Andrew was very excited to have the opportunity to, uh, to design gowns, to use a 1950s word, not dresses, gowns for our, um, our wonderful Cenerentola. So it's going to be, um, eventually when it happens, it is going to be a really beautiful, funny uh, production. Um, we're, we're riffing on the same ideas that we had in Barbieri, which was to be irreverent, but also respectful to the original. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Stephen. That gives us a, a sense. And maybe we can show um, the people who are viewing this podcast a couple of images uh, of, the, of the gowns, as you call them, which are stunningly beautiful. Um, think Audrey Hepburn, think Valentino, think Dior, think all these great designers from the, from the 50s whose uh, work we still revere. And David, um, um, we're going to go to you now, and um, a, a noted Rossinian, I think we can call you, as many as well as other things. You and I have worked together over the years, not so much, but a little bit, and we, we did a Handel opera together in uh, Spain about 20, 15 years ago, which was huge fun. Um, so I've never tried sung Rossini with you, but you've done Cenerentola and Barber and many of the Rossini operas uh, for most of your working life. So it's fantastic that you're able to share your brilliance and your experience and your insights with us. And um, so would you, I just, that's a sort of intro for you to start saying a little bit about this particular production, this project and how you're viewing it and um, sort of what stage it comes in your great Rossini um, <laughs> portfolio of work, as it were. Yeah, well, actually, Cenerentola was the, uh, was my debut over 40 years ago. I know it's incredible, but it's true. Um, and so it's a work that's very, very close to my heart. Um, I conducted a production of it. It was the first production I made with pr professionally uh, with, with uh, Colin Graham. Um, and I found it, it's quite interesting because actually before I did it, I had really no idea about Rossini at all. But somebody, well, in the form of Stuart Bedford, who run around English Music Theatre, decided that I would be, somehow it would suit me. And I'd always, being, you know, educated in the German classics, uh, the, the three Bs and all that malarkey, which you were very much in that period, the 50s and 60s, when I was uh, at school and so on, um, I'd always slightly turn my nose up at Rossini or in Italian music generally, probably. And so it was a voyage of discovery for me, which I've never looked back from, I must say, and I certainly never tired of Rossini. Uh, of course, Rossini is famous for his comic operas. Uh, in fact, the majority of his output is serious operas. And I think what's interesting is that now that I've conducted quite a few of the serious operas, um, you can see, um, you can see the shades of darkness in the comic operas as well. Um, which is not to say that they have to be heavy handed, on the contrary, I agree with Stephen, it needs to be done with the lightest possible touch because then the shades of darkness tell much better than if you kind of try to turn into, I don't know, some uh, massinate tra tragedy or something, which I know has been done, not a laugh to be heard and seen. Um, I think this is a very bad idea. So. Um, but it is interesting, nonetheless, uh, that these, this darkness is there against the incredible manic energy that you get so often with Rossini, almost, uh, I mean, almost um, psychotic energy. Um, I think, for me, what's also wonderful about Rossini is the um, strength of the structure um, within which there's a lot of fantasy. So it's kind of on the cusp, like Beethoven, on the cusp of a romanticism and classicism. Um, and you get actually the virtues of both, which I find intoxicating. Um, for me, the most important thing is that it's like a drug, Rossini's music. Once you've had it, you just have to have more. <laughs> so I think we should come and see Generator when we eventually get to put it on and um, submit to the drug. That's lovely. I love it being a drug. Um, I mean, one thing I would say is that it requires virtuoso singing 
of great technical prowess and also investment in or love of or knowledge of the language absolutely is crucial and it is really really hard to sing well I mean, t t we've got yes. enough stunning, I have to say, whether we can um, replicate uh, most of them, I hope we can, a stunning cast of, of many Italians. And I feel that, that the, the uh, like, like so much of our operatic music, the text leads to the music. And I feel even with all these, uh, these long coloratura and everything else, the language is at the heart of it. But some of this music is so hard to sing. So, um, and this is a lead into Jose Maria in a minute, but I just wonder if you'd say a little bit about that. You know, the, 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 it's not for everybody to be able to do Rossini. Rossini done badly is not really terribly fun, but Rossini done well is exhilarating. Yes, absolutely. I forgot to mention how difficult it is to sing, of course. I've only concerned myself for giving up beats. <laughs> no, but actually, no, you're right. And of course, the, what you're particularly right about is that, first of all, it comes, all of it comes from the text. And secondly, that the coloratura is always there for to intensify what's being said and what's being said musically. In other words, it's not um, it's not just decorative, but it, so and the the excitement of, of of everybody being on the edge because it's so difficult to sing is part of the the the, the energy that comes into the music. I think. But you're right. I mean, you have to have people who can sing. I was, there are quite a lot of people who claim to be able to sing who can't sing runs. Um, but as Maria Callas quite rightly said, if you can't sing a run, you can't sing. <laughs> so it's, it's a bit like a pianist been. saying, well, I can only play the chords. <laughs> um, so yes, people should, I think I always advise people, young singers to learn Rossini because, you know, it's for good for them to learn to sing coloratura because it actually frees up the voice. Well, David, I remember when I first met you, you came and played for one or two lessons with my then teacher, who was very much of the old school, Rupert Bruce Lockhart. And he always used to say, start with Handel, and then Handel moves through Mozart to Rossini, and the coloratura is all there initially in Handel. Uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's, it's the same thing, but, but no, much, much more longer, yes. wider, richer, faster, everything else in Rossini. So, I mean, I would say as a Handel singer, but not a Rossini singer, that I know exactly what, that, what it's all about and how difficult it is. But if you get it right, then it, it's the, it underpins your entire vocal craft, really, I would say. Yes, absolutely. So now we're on to Jose Maria. Salve, cara, buongiorno. Now, just to admit, just explain that Jose Maria is not at home where she lives in Milan, in Italy, Milano, because when this uh, dreadful crisis started a few weeks ago in earnest in Europe, she was singing performances like Clemenza di Tito in northwest France, in Nantes, where she still is. In, 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 is, that, is that right? Have I got that right? Uh, in Nantes. And... Nantes, that's right, exactly. Oh, Nancy. No, no, no not. No, no, I got it right. Not, and yeah, Northwest France, exactly. And there she still is with her two lovely dogs, Leila and Ottavia, and her lovely husband, Antonio, and um, <laughs> not able to go home to Milano. I don't know which is better, staying stuck in a, an apartment in Nantes or not being able to at home in, in dreadfully challenged Italy, North, especially Northern Italy, which is not a great place to be. And my, our heart goes out to everybody there in Italy and especially in Lombardia, where life has been appalling now for quite a few weeks. But let's not dwell on that. Here we're to, to dwell on you and the music of Rossini and La Cenerentola in particular. And we're going to hear you sing in a minute, Jose Maria, on a slightly pre-recorded, I think, either last night or this morning, with you singing in this departamento in Nantes and David Pano, Pare, I say David Piano, David Parry playing his piano in his house in Norfolk and getting these together is not quite as simple as one would like, but I hope we're going to sing. So, Jose Maria, um, welcome, lovely to see you, lovely to see you smiling, lovely to see you smiling with your lovely dogs in the background, and just say a little, a few words, if you would like, about uh, singing Angelina, which is what the part of Cenerentola is called in the opera, how many times you've done it, and, and where it sits in your sort of uh, performing um, life, as it were. Yeah, uh, above all, I love Rossini and Cenerentola. A lot of hearts uh, like my T-shirt uh, for them. Um, Rossini is uh, one of my favorite authors because wrote um, 
uh, a lot for my voice for mezzo soprano and also because uh, with him I did my important debut uh, like uh, Mary Bea in Pesaro or Rossini Opera Festival and my first concert in Scala uh, uh, with uh, Petit Messe Solennel and then I returned uh, with um, uh, Conturi. Uh, but uh, but uh, Cinerentola is the, the role that I, uh, I love uh, most because I, that is the role that I sang most of all. Uh, I love Cinerentola because, uh, uh, um, because my, my Cinerentola is not uh, every time uh, the same. I sang many productions and uh, I love to, to work with the director and, um, and conductor and with my colleagues uh, also, of course. And uh, it depends from my idea of, of a conductor and director and uh, to, to, to find a, a shape of my, of my Cenerentola. So my Cenerentola can be uh, more modern or more elegant or more funny. It depends from, I, from uh, the new idea of the, the, the production that I do. But uh, uh, what uh, that doesn't change for me is the soul of Cenerentola. And um, because uh, uh, she is uh, pure, uh, kind, uh, and uh, good, very good, because the, 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 the other title of the, this opera is The Triumph of Godness. Uh, triumph of the... <laughs> yeah, uh, so, so for me the, the, the most important thing is, uh, is uh, her soul and show her pure soul to, to, to the audience. That's lovely to hear. <laughs> and especially relevant for this particular time in which we're talking, I would say. How lovely, mm -hmm. was it Maria? So I think we're now going to lead into your, your singing. What, tell me the, the, the arias you're, we, we're now going to hear. Uh, uh, una volta c'era un re uh, is the first canzone of the, of the Cenerentola uh, when, when she uh, dreamed and, and uh, it was beautiful uh, singing our part in my apartment with, uh, with David in a other place uh, and, <laughs> and meet uh, uh, with, uh, with her. Thank you. Um, so I think we're going to wrap this up now. I think we've done probably enough for everybody. We'd have a little insights. Thank you all so very much for doing this. Anybody else want to say anything before we depart? No, it's great pleasure. <laughs> Thank I you. Love I can't wait see you all. us all to be doing the show together eventually. Yeah. Yes. And uh, I want to say thank you for your beautiful words about me. And... Uh, <laughs> I cannot wait to return uh, to the Grange. Fantastic. Oh. Yeah. Thank you, Jose Maria. And, and best love to your dogs and to your, to your, your, well, all the, well, your greater family. And uh, we'll sign off now. And I hope we'll be doing another one on one of the other operas we were supposed to be doing this year uh, in, a few, in, a, in, in, a, in a short time. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Ciao. 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 Oh, hey, fuck.